Hello students, welcome to the EPG Partshala. I am Mrs. Bojwani, and today we are going to discuss about a module on in vitro production of haploids part two under the paper plant biotechnology and crop improvement. In the last part one of this module, we had learned about the anther culture, microspore culture to produce androgenic haploids. In this module, we are going to learn some new techniques, some more technique to produce haploids in cultures. These are gynogenesis, where you trigger the cell of the female gametophyte to form gametosporophytic plants, or the technique of distant hybridization followed by embryo culture. We'll talk about the advantage and disadvantage of these techniques. We will also talk about the applications of haploids in plant breeding and genetics and limitations of haploid production by the three techniques. So we are talking about the applications and limitations of all the three in vitro methods of haploid production. In this module, we are talking about two methods of haploid production in tissue culture. One is gynogenesis. Gynogenesis is defined as the production of haploid from the female gametophyte or the cells of the female gametophyte. There are eight cells in the female gametophyte normally. One egg, two synergids, a central cell, and three antipodals. In tissue culture, generally, it has been possible to induce haploid production only from egg cell and the synergid cells. When you produce from egg cell, it is parthenogenesis. When you get from the synergid, it is apogamy. The plants produced by gynogenesis are much better than the endogenic plants, especially in the case of cereals, because cereal had Cereals had a problem in endogenesis because of the occurrence of large number of albinos. In this case, when you do gynogenesis in cereals, you get plants which are predominantly green, and therefore they are useful. The only limitation of this is that whereas in endogenesis you have a very large number of haploid cells to induce, here you have only eight cells, of which only two cells or three cells have been able to form embryo. But the advantage is great because of the functional green haploids. The other technique that we are going to talk about is the distant hybridization and followed by embryo culture. It is not a technique purely a tissue culture, but it involves tissue culture at a later stage. It was observed in 1974 that if you cross a barley plant with a wild, wild barley species, particularly Hordium bulbosum, the fertilization occurs, but within a few divisions of the zygote, all the chromosomes of the bulbosum are selectively thrown out, and the cell is left with the only haploid number of chromosomes of barley. And when this develops into an embryo and the plant, the plant is haploid. Unfortunately, these haploid embryos are not able to grow in nature beyond a 10 days, after which they will abort. Therefore, it is necessary to isolate the healthy embryo before abortion in culture on artificial medium. And it has been possible to produce haploids of uh, wheat, barley, and cucumis by this method. We will talk about the overall advantages of haploid, the applications of haploid. Therefore, the gynogenesis becomes very important in those plants, in those crop plants, as a matter of fact, where the androgenesis is not possible or the androgenesis is fraught with the problems. The gynogenesis is achieved by culturing unfertilized ovules 
ovaries, or even the florets, a piece of inflorescence under aseptic conditions. And uh, the stage at which you culture the ovules is generally eight nucleate stage. But it is said that in the rice, the best stage is to culture it at one to four nucleate embryo set. But even here, when it forms an sporophyte, the embryo sac undergoes full development and becomes a mature embryo sac, and then only it undergoes sporophyte development. And after the first discovery of um, dinogenesis was done in 1974 by Saint Noyon uh, in Barley, and today we have about 25 species of plants, including major crop plants, where gynogenesis has been possible. Now, the factors that affect gynogenesis are similar to the endogenesis, like you have to have a suitable medium, you have to have uh, the right stage at which the ovule are cultured, and then we have to be able to give it pretreatment of cold temperature to induce gynogenesis. As I said, that you culture the ovules or anything, it develops into a mature embryo sac and then forms embryo. Now, within the embryo sac, there are eight cells. Generally, it is the egg, unfertilized egg, which gives rise to the plant. But in rice, it is said that the synergy forms the plant. In uh, embryological terms, when a sporophyte arises from an egg without fertilization, it is known as parthenogenesis. And when it arises from any other cell of the embryo sac, it is apogamy. One can illustrate this with the example of uh, mulberry, which also is a non-androgenic plant. It's a tree species, and in all efforts to produce haploids by anthroculture have been unsuccessful. And uh, we, the, the embryo sex, the ovule culture, we cluster, culture a cluster of ovules attached to the placenta. If you detach the ovule from the placenta, the ovules are not responding. The ovules are to be cultured, four or five ovules attached to a piece of placenta and culture to get the response. And in this case, the response is by direct embryogenesis, that the cell, the egg cell, undergoes normal development to form embryo without fertilization. And since fertilization does not take place, the plant formed by the egg is haploid. Now, this is an important feature of gynogenesis. As I said, that the endogenesis had albino plants in the case of cereals. Here, these plants which are produced by gynogenesis are predominantly green. The occurrence of albino is either absent or it is a very low frequency. And the diploid stage also, the occurrence of diploids or the non-haploids is also very poor. The distance hybridization with a chance observation in Kasha and Kohl in 1970 made a cross between Hordium vulgare and Hordium bulbosum. Hordium vulgare is the normal barley and bulbosum is a wild variety of uh, Hordium. When they were crossed, within a few divisions of um, the zygote, all the chromosomes of bulbosum were selectively eliminated and the embryo was left only with the chromosome of Hordium vulgare. But unfortunately, the embryo, after about 10 days, started to abort. It couldn't survive a single set of chromosome of Hordium vulgare in nature, maybe because the endosperm development was not normal. Therefore, when these people isolated the embryo 
in a healthy state before the abortion started and nurture it on an artificial medium, they were able to get full plants, which turned out to be haploids of Cordium vulgare. And thereafter, number of people became interested. Barclay in 75 produced haploids of Triticum estivum, or the wheat, by crossing with bulbosum. And now it is said that if the Triticum estivum is crossed with maize, the maize chromosomes are selectively eliminated and you get Triticum estivum. And this has become a standard technique to produce haploids of uh, wheat. And we now all have, have a method to produce haploids of Cucumis sativus mm-hmm. by po- pollinating it with irradiated pollen of this plant. And in 2004, they could produce some haploids of Cucumis sativus. And we now have a method by which people have been able to produce haploids of Arabidopsis thaliana, not by crossing. But they realized that people were asking a question, why the chromosomes of a particular plant are selectively eliminated? And molecular basis, we don't know very much, but it has now been identified that there is a gene associated with the centromere, which differently links the centromere of the two chromosomes to the microtubules, the spindle fibers. And because of that, one of the parents' chromosomes are lost. They have shown that by manipulating this particular gene, they have been able to get haploids of Arabidopsis and also diploids from a tetraploid of Arabidopsis. In other ways, there is a reduction reducing the chromosome number to half. So at least one molecular indication of association of gene with the selective elimination of chromosome is there. We still know to know more. You can see the technique involved in distant hybridization to produce is to emasculate the plants because you should not allow the plant to get pollinated normally. The plants, the flowers are emasculated, carefully the stamens are removed, and the anthers are then pollinated with the desired parent. In the case of Hordium vulgare and bulbosum, the pollen of bulbosum are used to cross. In the case of wheat, the wheat are pollinated with zea maize. And this requires a bit of gibralic acid a drop of gibralic acid is poured on the top of the ovary to promote the development of the embryo. And after some stage, before the embryo starts to abort, it is excised, placed on a culture medium, and developed. We still don't know how the chromosomes of one parent are selectively thrown out and the embryo is formed with the chromosome of the other parent. The, the molecular mechanism is still not known, but recently there is a suggestion that some genes associated with the centromere, which results in unequal reaction with the spindle fiber, causes the abortion of the, the the loss of the chromosomes. In the case of Arabidopsis thaliana, the haploids have been obtained by manipulating this gene, which is called as CENH31. By manipulating this gene, they could get haploids of uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, and they could get diploids from a tetraploid plant by the same technique, which means that the chromosomes of the one parent were eliminated in the process. Now, haploids are with single set of chromosomes. Whichever way you produce, whether it's by androgenesis, gynogenesis, or distant hybridization, they have one set of chromosomes. And therefore, they are not fertile plants because meiosis is not normal, 
because of lack of homologous chromosome. Therefore, it is important that to utilize these haploid plants to make them fertile was must diplodize the chromosome number in these plants and the routine technique as used by plant breeders is by treating with colchicine. This is treated with colchicine and the chromosome number is diplodized. In the case of brassica, they take five, 10 or 15 plants and immerse the roots of these plants in colchicine solution for five to six days and then they plant and a fair number of these haploids are diplodized and become fertile. See, the importance of haploids in genetics and plant breeding is well described in the books. And it was known for a very long time. But unfortunately, the breeders and the geneticists were not able to exploit it because of the non-availability of haploids. As I told you earlier that the occurrence of haploid in nature is extremely low. Now, we have three methods to produce haploids. We have been able to produce haploids by androgenesis in over 250 species. We have been able to produce gynogenetic haploids in about 25 species. And we have been able to produce haploids by distant hybridization and embryo culture in some cereals and non-cereal plants. So we now have the methods, reliable and reproducible methods, to produce haploids. And therefore, the application of haploids in breeding has been started, and a large number of new varieties have been produced. The main advantage that one anticipated in the application of haploid was to achieve homozygosity very fast. Normally, the homozygosity is achieved by repeated backcrossing, which takes several years. Here, if you have one set of chromosomes, the haploid, and you diplodize it, the diplodized plant is a homozygous plant. The whole chromosomes, the pair are replication of each other. Therefore, we now have homozygosity. And therefore, all the mutations and all the characters in the hybrids are visible. So selection becomes very fast and easy, and that can be done very fast in using the haploid. The plants that are produced in vitro by endogenesis or gynogenesis show large variation in the population. And it is expected because these are the cells from which these plants are rising are product of meiosis, which involves recombination and segregation. And therefore, the expectation is that you will have a lot of variation. And variation at the haploid stage. So you can screen the haploid plants in the field and select the desirable traits, the individual with a desirable trait, and fix the character by diplodization. And such a variation are known as gametoclonal variation as against the variation occurring in somatic tissue culture as soma clonal variation. The haploids that are produced from the gametic cells, and you know the gametes are formed by the process of meiosis, and meiosis is characterized by recombination and segregation. And therefore, the population that you get from these is heterogeneous. There's a lot of variation. And people have been able to isolate from this variation a large number of useful plants. The genetic variation taken advantage of from the haploid progeny is called gametoclonal variation. And using this technology, improved varieties of crop plants have been obtained, such as a Dama variety of rice. There is another unexpected application of uh, androgenesis. We know that asparagus is a dioecious plant, 
So the male and female plant are separate. And the genetic basis is XY chromosome. XX is a female and XY is male. Therefore, in a male plant where you do androgenesis, some of the pollen plants carry X chromosome, some of the plants carry Y chromosomes. When you diplodize these, you get XX, which is a female. You also get YY, which does not exist in nature. This is a super male, which does not exist in nature. And all the pollen grains that will be formed by YY plants carry Y chromosomes. So when this is crossed with X, the female plant, where all the gametes are X, 100% progeny is XY, which means male. And in market, you know, the asparagus is important vegetable. The spears of asparagus are eaten. It's a delicacy. And the spears of male plants has a higher market value than the female because the male spears have less of fibers. Therefore, now you have an opportunity to produce 100% higher quality plants, which are all male and therefore highly important and highly quality spears. So we, in this module, which in vitro production of haploids part two, we have talked about the techniques of gynogenesis and distant hybridization followed by embryo culture for the production of haploids. It is shown that many of the limitations of the androgenesis, such as not applicability to some crop plants, appearance of albinos in cereals, and the appearance of non-haploid have been to a large extent overcome by these two techniques. These two techniques are now being used for a large number of species. The gynogenesis is the production of haploid from the cells of the gametophyte, which is embryo sac. And so we get the plants from the egg cell or the synergid. On the other hand, in the technique on distant hybridization, what happens is that when you cross two parents, the chromosomes of one of the parents are selectively eliminated after the fertilization within a few divisions of the zygote. And the embryo becomes with cells with haploid number of chromosomes. But unfortunately, this haploid embryo is not able to grow beyond 10 days. And after that, it starts to degenerate. People have realized that one can rescue this embryo by culturing it on an artificial medium and raise full plants. So there is yet another technique to produce haploids. And these both techniques are being applied for the production of haploids of crop. And distant hybridization is especially applicable to cereals such as barley and wheat. Thank you.